بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد I commence by praising Allah سبحانه وتعالى sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his entire household, all his companions, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and may Allah grant them all goodness and may he bless every single one of us and grant us all goodness as well. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, the Quran, revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we all know, unquestionable, undeniable, we believe that it is the only book in existence that the accuracy is not disputed at all and at the same time we know that the verses of this Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not revealed that which is unnecessary that which has no lesson in it that which is just a waste of time may Allah forbid so every single detail of the Quran is of relevance in our lives in different ways if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed a story, we should understand that one of the most important issues concerning the stories narrated and related in the Quran is the fact that we are to draw lessons from these stories. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Yusuf, after having made mention of the most beautiful of stories and that is the story of the Prophet Joseph may peace be upon him Allah says لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبَرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى Indeed in their stories which means in the stories of the previous messengers of those of a long time ago there are lessons for those with sound intellect. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it clear. He says these are not just fabrications. They are not just tales. It is not something that was narrated without purpose. So to name an entire chapter of the Quran after a group of people or a story shows the relevance of that group or the story. And this surah is none other than Surah Al-Kahf. I'm sure we all hear that it is important to read this surah on a Friday. Have you heard that before? Surah Al-Kahf. According to one of the narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Surah Al-Kahf is to be read on a Friday. It does not mean you should not read it on another day, nor does it mean that you should not read the rest of the Quran. But it shows the importance of this beautiful surah. Al-Kahf referring to the cave. And Ahlul Kahf or Ashabul Kahf, the people of the cave. So what is this cave all about? This cave has a beautiful story behind it or about it. It's such a beautiful story that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of it at the beginning of the surah, just a few verses into the surah, and Allah says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the kahf. Am hasibta anna ashab al-kahf wal-raqim kanu min ayatina ajaba idh awal fitiyatu ila al-kahf. Allah speaks about the cave, and He tells us the story of the people of the cave. 
those young people who sought refuge in the cave. So what were they seeking refuge from? It is reported in the books of Tafsir and history that there was a tyrant ruler and a lot of polytheism was taking place at that time. People believed and worshipped or worshipped deities besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and had weird beliefs. And there was a group of young men who questioned all this. And they asked each other and they asked their community leaders, what is it that you are believing? What is it that you are worshipping? How can you worship deities besides your own maker? If really you are sensible people, you would only worship the one who made you. Obviously that makes sense. You would only worship the one who made you. And so they began to question, they began to ask, and they were being harassed, persecuted as a result. They decided, you know, let's pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help and guidance. So they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help them, to guide them, to show them a way, to protect them from the evil of society and community. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala records this dua in this beautiful surah right at the beginning. When I say the beginning, I mean the first story that is being made mention of in this beautiful surah. And there are several stories in the surah. It's not just the story of the people of the cave. So they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they said, Rabbana atina min ladunka rahmah. وَهَيِّئْ لَنَا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا رَشَدًا O our Rabb, grant us from you mercy. Have mercy on us. And make easy for us our affairs, the affairs of righteousness and goodness, that which is correct and upright. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in that cave that the group of men decided, or young men decided to get together, Allah caused them to fall asleep. They fell asleep. Now if you and I are really tired, how many hours would we sleep for? Perhaps six hours? Some of you might say eight, some might say nine. And some of the new generation might say twelve. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. May He help us. So, we would sleep perhaps 12 hours. After that, can you sleep any longer? You would need pills and you would need perhaps artificial methods of making you prolong your sleep. But with these young men, they fell off to sleep in such a way that Allah records it in the Quran. They were asleep for more than 300 years. 300 years. Imagine not three hours, three months, three days, no, three days, three months, no, three years, no, 30 years, 300 years. There was a tyrant ruler when they had got into the cave at that particular time. And when they got up, we'll find out in a few moments what exactly happened. But while they were asleep, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved them, protected them in a unique way. So the sunrise and sunset were such that it did not pierce or the rays of the sun did not fall upon them to affect their skin or to affect their bodies in any way. It rose in the right, set in the, in the left and at the same time they moved in their sleep or according to some narrations their eyes were opened. And other narrations make mention of the fact that they, they moved, tossed and turned. Because if a person doesn't move at all for 300 years, what would happen? Allah knows perhaps they might you know, be affected by bugs or the insects and so on. Their bodies will be affected definitely. And so subhanallah, they moved and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if anyone had seen them in that condition, they would have ran away. 
they would have run away. Because imagine if you see someone sleeping and their eyes are wide open and they're moving and you're looking at them and they're fast asleep, what would happen? So Allah says, لَوِ اطَّلَعْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ لَوَلَّيْتَ مِنْهُمْ فِرَارًا Had you seen them, had you looked at them, you would have run away from them. Because it would be scary. Now let's pause there for a moment and draw a lesson or two. Firstly, the concern. The concern of these youth. They were asking questions. How many of us ask questions? It's very important. Today, for example, you listen to something online. It sounds very enticing, very attractive. But you need to ask questions. Is this right? What I heard, is it substantiated? Is it correct? Go and ask real people that you know what it's all about so that you will be protected. You'll be protected from what? From wrong information, misinformation, or sometimes a deviant path that might be seemingly attractive. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. There is a lot of intolerance being promoted online, for example. A lot of extremism that is being promoted on the internet. And this is why we say, learn to ask questions. Learn to ask those whom you know with knowledge. Learn to look at the adults, the older people, those who have knowledge, the senior scholars, and ask them. Find out before you fall into the traps of the devil. It's a point we learn from the people of the cave. They asked questions. And they were not satisfied until they received the correct answers. And when they didn't receive answers, they went into the mode where they began to meditate or they began to ponder over solutions. Just like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at a certain stage in his life when he was about 40 years old, he used to frequent the cave of Hira. What did he used to do there? He used to ponder, he used to meditate, reflect over the evil condition of the people of Quraysh at the time and solutions. And this is when revelation came to him later on. As for the people of the cave, they were a group of people. And they were like-minded people. You know, one of the narrations is very interesting. It makes mention of how uh, they did not know each other. According to one of the narrations in uh, Ibn Kathir, rahmatullahi alayhi, has made mention of it. He says, they did not know each other and they arrived at the same cave and met each other there and they had the same purpose. Which means if these were all separated people, who were concerned about the same matters and issues. And each one of them thought, you know what, the safest place for me is to go into seclusion. So let me go to a specific place. So one goes and he sees the other and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh. Uh, there is a discrepancy as to their exact number and we'll get to that in a few moments inshallah. But at the end of the day, whether they knew each other or not is besides the point. The reality is they got to meet like-minded people, and I want to raise a very interesting point from that. And that is, the company you keep will make you or break you. Your friends, the friends you have, should be people who are like-minded. People who guide you. People who are equally concerned about being upright, about serving humanity, serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the service of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what does that mean? I'm serving Allah by giving out a charity. I'm serving Allah by being courteous. I'm serving Allah by developing my character. And all these are being kind and good to the rest of the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So yes, and I want to serve Allah by directly worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I will worship none besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same time, I will follow the footsteps of those who were sent to me by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach me what I should be doing and what I should not be doing. So the company you keep is very, very important. A lot of young people are led astray by those who are their friends, their company, companions. And there are so many examples of those who have learned something good, those who have been encouraged to visit the masjid or to fulfill salah or to dress appropriately 
or to fulfill any other obligations or to abstain from prohibitions because of their friends. When the friends do the same, we find it easier to follow. So this is a beautiful example that we learn from these young men. And this beautiful story continues. These people had taken with them their dog. Now one might ask, why did they take their dog? The truth is, I don't know. But I do know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised very important issues in the same surah. Very important issues. And one of these issues is the debates surrounding the people of the cave. Do you know that later on, obviously this was at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa if you go back to the reasons of revelation of Surah Al-Kahf or the story of the people of the cave, you will find that the Jewish people in Medina Munawwara had asked the Prophet peace be upon him, they asked him a few questions. And one of them was, we want to know about the people who had gone away for a long time. If you're really a prophet, tell us. If you really get revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tell us. We want to know the story. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the story. But then came the debate. What was the debate? The debate has been there from the time this story was initially revealed in the Old Testament and even before when the Jews had asked a question regarding the color of the dog of the people of the cave. What color was the dog? So some said it was light in color. Some said no, it was dark in color. And a huge dispute occurred. This is a very, very important point. They were debating. Debating about what? Debating about the color of the dog. Like it's going to change the story. Allahu Akbar. And then the debate that is made mention of in the Quran is how many were these youngsters? We want to know. So some say, oh, they were, they were, they were three and the fourth was the dog. And some say, no, they were four or five. The sixth was the dog. And some say, no, no, no. They were seven. The eighth was the dog. Huge dispute, argument. Allah doesn't tell us the answer. Do you know why? It's irrelevant. So what? Even if there were 80 of them. What is of essence is the lesson. There is a debate also. Were these people before Jesus or after Jesus? Debate. Whether they were before or after. It doesn't really cut any ice, so to speak. Were these people in Rome or in Palestine? Debate. Argument. Wallahi, these are arguments made mention of. Where exactly were they? And this is why... A lot of countries boast the sleeper's cave. Have you seen that? You go to Turkey, they show it to you. You go to Egypt, they show it to you. You go to Asham, they show it to you. So where exactly were they? Well, that's the point being raised. No matter where they were, it's the lesson. What do we have to learn from this powerful point? We as Muslimin sometimes debate about unnecessary matters and we lose focus upon the main goal and we don't realize that we are in actual fact, causing harm to the ummah because we are fighting over petties, things that are irrelevant, small matters. You know, I raise my finger this way or that way or I make a circle in salah or I don't and that's it. This guy, is, uh, he belongs to a deviant sect, that's it. Why? His finger. It's a reality. These are the type of arguments, these are the type of debates that we have. That which means nothing. Let's talk about the essence, the most important thing. Are you worshipping Allah alone? That's a question we can, we can ask. And that is an answer that we have to give. Are you really following this prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's an important question. Because I say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah What a beautiful statement. What did I say? I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. So the primary question is, do I worship Allah alone? That's what we talk about. And I say, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger. The one, what's the meaning of a messenger? Someone who came to us with a message. That's what it means. If I say this guy is that guy's messenger, that means he's just a messenger. He came and he delivered some 
uh, mail, for example. So you open the envelope and you see what exactly is there. And you know this message is actually from someone who has employed the messenger. In the case of Allah, it's not the issue of employment and so on. It is the issue of nubuwa, prophethood. And this is why it is called a risala It's the message. The message. The messenger's duty is to deliver the message. I declare that I will worship Allah alone. That's, that's how I can enter the fold of Islam. So if I don't do that, I exit the fold of Islam. We follow? And at the same time, if I say he is a messenger, well, bring the message. I want to see the message. Subhanallah. I want to see the message. What is the message? Here is the Quran revealed. Here is the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Quran teaches you that you must emulate the example because this messenger is unique. He has come to you conforming to that which Allah has revealed. Amazing. It's actually a gift of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Something unique. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a man to show us how to adopt the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine if an angel had come and the angel was fulfilling salah. A lot of us would say, well, that's an angel. We, can't fulfill, we cannot fulfill that salah. If the angel came and for example taught us how to do wudu and how to sleep and how to get up and how to talk, we would just have an excuse to say, you know what, he is an angel. To, to this day, people say, well, he was... I'm not a prophet. That's not an excuse. Allah says, we have sent him down as a beautiful example to emulate, to follow, to copy. Subhanallah. You know, with us, especially with the sisters, someone makes a beautiful cake and they ask you, can I please have the recipe? You say, no. Cannot have it. Cannot. You know, it's... <laughs> someone, you just say, look, you know what? That's my own secret. We don't want. We're not allowed to copy. Someone makes something, invents something, and we say, no, copyright, reserved. If no one can copy. But the most beautiful of gifts ever, that is the Quran, the Sunnah. When Muhammad ﷺ did something, it became an act of worship to copy it. Copy it exactly as is. No one's going to tell you copyright. Because why? In fact, you have to copy. That's the only way out. May Allah help us. So let's learn to smile because he smiled. Let's copy that smile, mashallah. So this is the concern that we have. But to fight over petty items, I learn from the story of the people of the cave. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they ask questions. What are the questions? Sayaquluna thalathatur rabi'uhum kalbuhum. People will say, oh, three, the fourth was the, the dog. Some will say, no, five, the sixth was the dog, and so on. And Allah says, Say that my Rabb knows the exact figure. How many they were, Allah knows. For you and I, it's irrelevant. And from this we learn that matters of the unseen, my brothers and sisters, we cannot accept them from anyone and everyone. We need to take them from Allah we start where Allah starts and we stop where Allah stops without wanting to know more because Allah's kept it unseen. People want to know every detail. Okay, so like I said, was the dog sitting with its legs stretched towards the front or the back? A question. Even if we knew the answer, how did it change the story? These are details that are absolutely irrelevant. You know, and wallahi, this is a crisis we face in the ummah today. People want to know fine details. I recall a few years back, I witnessed two kids, little children talking to each other. And I began to laugh because one says, no, your hair is combed wrong. He says, why? He says, you see, my mother combs it and I've got this path here on the side and yours is in the middle. Yours is wrong. And this guy says, no, my mom is right. Yours is wrong. And I'm laughing at it. And I thought to myself, that's what we do as an ummah. That's what, these are kids, children fighting about hair. And they're fighting about hair because each one thinks his mother is it, you know. Mashallah. And each one thinks my mother can never be wrong. But they don't realize it's just a hairstyle. You comb this way, the other one comb that way, one comb to the side, one comb to the back. Big deal. It doesn't make you an ape. May Allah protect us. Although there are some new hairstyles that, that one might argue that they look more like apes. May Allah protect us. 
But the, the point is made that look, we need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance and let's concentrate on major matters, matters of learning. Whilst debating about a finger and a hand, we have lost track of the fact that perhaps we might not even be following the example of the Prophet ﷺ at all. We might be, we might not even be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly. We have major matters. We treat each other in a way that is not befitting the Muslim ummah. We doubt each other, we backbite, we gossip, we slander, we hate, we are jealous of, we create problems, not realizing that Islam is the opposite of all that. We should be resolving crises, we should be creating ease in the lives of others and so on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us through a beautiful story. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these young people, when they got up, they asked the question, how long have we stayed here? How long have we stayed here? And the one reply is saying, I think a day or a part of a day. Because obviously initially when you, go off to, when you fall off to sleep and you get up, you know that it can't be more than a day. It won't be more than 24 hours. It should be part of a day. But things are looking a little bit messy here. Because obviously their clothing, tatty or you know, old, creased and so on. Uh, they looked at each other. It took them a short time. Very quickly they realized, you know, there's something amiss, something wrong here. And so they knew that there was a tyrant ruler outside and in this cave they had sought refuge and now they, had, they were hungry, they required a little bit of food and so they sent the one with some of the currency they had. And they said, look, go into the city, be careful. Come back with good food. Come back with that which is good, pure. And what will happen? Make sure that they don't recognize you. They might trouble you. They might engage in their persecutions once again. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this again in Surah Al-Kahf. Amazing. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, When this young man went, he was recognized by the people because his clothing is of an age 300 years back. Imagine... If you were to take the clothing that was worn 30 years back, you would recognize this person is from the 60s. I think our kids tell us that sometimes. Dad, you're living in the 60s, man. And I tell my son, you weren't even there to know what the 60s was all about. You know, If we go back to the early 1900s, you might find the Victorian era with the dress code. If they had to dress that way, they would all look like Muslims. Subhanallah. It changes with the changing of time. So three entire centuries later, 309 years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 300 years and we, we increased it by nine. You know, I read something interesting about it. They say, when this story is made mention of in the Old Testament, the, the, the 300 years is made mention of. And in the Quran it says, 300 years and we added nine. So one of the interesting points is the difference between the solar and the lunar years. If you take a look at 300 years, according to the solar calendar, or should I say today's maybe Gregorian calendar, and you were to convert it into lunar years, you would get exactly 309. For every 35 years, you add a year. So 300 years, you add 9 years. So that's the beauty or one of the points that some have raised. Whether it's actually relevant or not is besides the point. It's just something interesting. It's an interesting point. So 309 is 300 plus the 9. And that 9 would convert a solar to a lunar year. But after such a long time, the currency that was brought out in order to pay for the food was something totally different. So when they were known, uh, they were brought forth. And now they were surprised to see that in this time, the ruler had changed. The situation and condition had changed. People were worshipping Allah. And there were good people around. And they came back and lived as a miracle in society. These are the people who were given life. Literally after death, they were asleep for 309 years. And look at them today. 
They're awake. They're alive. This is a gift of Allah. It shows the power of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how many of us are prepared to sacrifice? How many of us are prepared to sacrifice even in the smallest way? To learn the deen, to put it into practice, to convey it to others, to be able to pass the, the torch down to the next generations, to be able to have this beautiful concern for the ummah. My brothers and sisters, I've just made mention of a portion of this beautiful story. Inshallah, my colleague will, will take over and he will continue with more lessons. I hope that we've seen that a lot of the debates connected to the finer details of the people of the cave are actually irrelevant. And the answers are not given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi So whatever we read regarding the finer details, a lot of it is questionable. And the point being raised is that do not waste your life arguing about petties, small matters and items, fighting over things that are really irrelevant, whether it is in your home, whether it is in your community, society, or as an ummah at large, or even humanity at large. Imagine people are dying across the globe and we are busy arguing about some small matter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah bless us. Just a quick point before I close. The surah has in it a few lessons. Like I said, it's not just the story of the people of the cave in this beautiful surah. But this story of the people of the cave is the first. Thereafter, Allah has made mention of the people of the garden or the man of the garden. The man who was bestowed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with so much. And he related it to himself. He said, this I've been given because of myself. And this is the test of wealth. And he was corrected by his friend to say, no, when you have been given something, remember that it's from Allah. The lesson we learn from this, my brothers and sisters, no matter what you have, intellect, wealth, qualifications, degrees, position, children, whatever you have, related to Allah. Understand how insignificant man is in comparison to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are totally insignificant. When we leave, we leave with absolutely nothing. And then you have the story of Musa, or Moses may peace be upon him, Musa alayhi salam and al-Khidr, that is made mention of in Surah al-Kahf. What a beautiful story. It's important for you to read it. The test of knowledge, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing the Prophet Musa alayhi salam that if we want, we can give pockets of knowledge to whomsoever we wish. And you know the story when uh, Al-Khidr was going with Musa alayhi salam and he did certain things that Musa alayhi salam did not understand. And uh, Al-Khidr says, I've been given some knowledge by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the test of knowledge. No matter what you know, my brothers and sisters, someone will have more knowledge than you. وَفَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ Above all those with knowledge is the one who has supreme knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's like a hierarchy. You have those with knowledge and then you have those with more and those with more. And some might have knowledge of certain matters and not knowledge of the others. So we bring them together. And above all, we have Al-Alim, the one who has absolutely all the knowledge. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we have the story of Dhul Qarnayn towards the end of the surah, where Allah makes mention of the test of power, authority. He was a powerful ruler, but he was just. He was just. No matter what position you have, whether it's in the home, the authority you have over perhaps those who are, you know, your children and so on, never abuse that authority. Even at your workplace, fulfill your role. Don't abuse authority. Make sure that you have uh, fulfilled what you are supposed to be fulfilling. Even if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with such authority that you become a ruler of a nation or you become the CEO of a huge company, don't let that make you arrogant. He who raised you can drop you. When you are high above, make sure that you serve the people. Bearing in mind the duties upon you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
How beautiful is the example of he or she who has been placed in some form of authority yet they understand their humbleness in front of Allah. They fulfill their prayers. They fulfill their obligations unto Allah. They are humble. They understand that they are just a human being. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. So these are just some of the examples, some of the lessons that we draw from this beautiful story as well as the surah itself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness. May Allah bless us all. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad.